Hello. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the episode two of Grey Rhino Show. Just now, I was scrolling through the list. I saw quite a few familiar names. Those people who joined us from the first session, thank you very much for coming back to us. And then for those people who are joining us for the first time, welcome to our Grey Rhino Show. Uh, just a simple introduction about what is Grey Rhino in case you... Okay, hi, Jian Yin. Thank you very much for your greeting. Okay, in case you do not have a clear understanding what this is all about, our Grey Rhino show is a bi-weekly series. So we want to hold it a series so that uh, every time we meet, we will be able to share with you real-time updates of the economy as well as the market situation. So last week, we had our speaker, Mr. Xiao Kit Wee, who shared with us uh, about the unemployment rate of US, the relationship between the economy and the stock market, and then he also started with the case study of one local bank, which is DBS. So for those who have missed the first episode, don't worry. You have not missed too much because you decided to join us from the second episode for moving forward. And then, so if you want to have a, okay, just now before the webinar started, what you have seen is actually the throwback from our first episode. So let's say if you would like to watch the full episode of our, of our Grey Rhino show, you can actually go to YouTube, type in Unicorn Financial Solutions. You'll be able to find the full video there. Okay, so in this one hour episode, uh, same thing. I'll just, I'm just going to share with you what's going to happen because we don't have a lot of time. We want to keep it short and sweet. So we'll be having economic update from Kate V. Market update, that will be for the first half of the session, and then followed by a case study. Last session, we started with DBS, but due to time constraint, we were not able to finish it. This time round, please stay tuned with us. We will be having more interesting facts and analysis about DBS. Okay. After that, after the case study, we will actually be having a Q&A. So from now till the Q&A session, as you're listening to Kate Reed, please feel free to key in the questions that you have in mind. You can key in the question using uh, the chat function on the top right-hand corner of your screen. So you can just type it there. But uh, okay, because I will be the one who facilitate the Q&A session, I will do my very, very best to answer all the very good questions that you have for this evening. But, but if due to time constraint, let's say if you all have like 100 questions, I'm afraid we won't be able to do so. So please give me this, uh, this authority okay, or this, this uh, chance to be making the decision, which will be the question to be answered. I'll try to choose a question that will be benefiting most people in the session today. Okay. Then after that, so after the Q&A session, um, we'll be having a game. This is to inject some fun element to thank all of you for deciding to join us today. So for this game, it will be good if you can be having two devices. So for example, if now you are watching our show using your iPad or let's say your laptop, it will be good if you can have your handphone with you later for this game. I'll be sharing with you more. So remember, prepare for yourself two devices to enjoy the game. Okay, uh, let me just share a little bit about our speaker again. So our speaker for today, Kate V, he is the head of investment for our company, Unicorn Financial Solutions. Personally, he has been investing for about 19 years. So for those who have met him before, or those who saw him from last week, maybe in your mind, you might be thinking, hey, did Kate Wee started investing at the age of 10 since you mentioned he has invested for 19 years? Don't worry, we are very prim and proper. Just that, because Kate Wee takes very good care of his health and then he does meditation very often, therefore he's able to maintain his view. So without further ado, without further ado, I know all of you are here to see him, not me. So can I take this opportunity to share all, with all of you? Let the Grey Rhino show begin. Okay, a uh, very good evening to every one of you. Um, thanks for joining us today. Okay, and uh, I heard you know, we have about 300 friends with us today. 
So really uh, wonderful to have all of you to spend this one hour with us you know, every fortnight. Okay, as Shuri mentioned, so we'll be going through you know, um, a short economic update, financial updates, and today I'd like to have more time to go through about DBS you know, and four different types of companies uh, today. Yeah, and where does DBS belong to? Let me just go to my slides. Okay, so the last time round, I was sharing, you know, what has gone on so far. And I said, um, well, by now, I think we have ended round one. If you see this picture, it was actually the sports photo of the century. It is showing the, you know, the late Muhammad Ali, who was a boxing legend, and he stood over the previous world champion, Sony Liston, in 1964. And that was when he won his first uh, heavyweight championship. Yeah, so, the, you know, it's like a boxing match. You know, has, he, has the competitor been knocked out in round one? In this case, the competitor we are talking about is the economic hardship caused by the virus. Or will there be round two? And if round two happens, how does it look like? Okay, let me just take you through where has the markets been? Okay, so since the start of the year, yeah, and about 12th of February, the market started to have a sharp fall. Yeah, so it fell... 34% yeah, in um, just over a month, okay? And just like what I shared just now, if you caught the video, that the world stock market pivoted on the 23rd of March because of what the Federal Reserve has done. And since then, so the stock markets went up about 24% yeah, after that, you know, for about a month. And then after that, it has basically been trending sideways yeah, for the last one month. Okay, that's how the market has been. The market I use is the MSCI All World Index, which is a representative of uh, a lot of countries, including the developed and the developing markets. Okay, just to share with you, you know, what has caused uh, this round one, I think that's it's over. But so what happened in round one? Round one, where we had this uh, a big slowdown in the economy. The last time we talked about, I mean, we talk about 20% of US population were out of job. Uh, and this time round, the number has gone up from, from 20% to 25% of the US working population being out of job. Okay, and uh, so there was a lot of uh, massive government stimulus to try to revive, you know, to give people some handouts. And I think in Singapore, we ourselves have experienced it as well. And secondly, well, there are some on and off positive trial results. So some of it come and it goes. Well, but I think most, I would say, uh, medical experts they say that you know, it usually takes about a year to a year and a half, and that is fast track already you know, to be able to come up with a vaccine. But also some, uh, now we have some good news uh, as Moderna, you know, one of his vaccines went to the stage two of the trial. Okay, but I say, but it's still too early to celebrate. Thirdly, um, well, starting now, well, we have a planned gradual lifting of the lockdown. Okay, so the first country that went into this virus came out first. So China was the first country to have this virus. So it was the first company, the first country to have this uh, lifting of the lockdown, followed by Europe and then US. Yeah. So now as we are speaking, the world is trying to come out of the lockdown situation. Yeah. And then the last one, which I, which I said caused the pivot in the 23rd of March, which was an all-out approach by the US Federal Reserve, their central bank, you know, to in, inject a huge dose of huge dose of monetary policies. First, by lowering interest rates within ten days, yeah, from one point five percent all the way to zero, and then on the nineteenth of March, yeah, they said they're going to print money to the extent of seven hundred fifty billion. But they didn't come the market. A few days later, on the twenty third of March, they said they're going to do quantitative easing, infinity, yeah, which means they said I'm going to print as much money to flood the market with as much money just to calm the situation. But it kind of has worked, as we've seen just now. So the 23rd of March, the stock market pivoted. So this is what happened in round one. So I think now round, round one is kind of over. So would that be a round two? Yeah, or would, it, would this, uh, how, or would that be round three, round four? I think that is currently the questions on everyone's mind. And I think the stock market is behaving like there's only going to be round one. Yeah. So I think the stock market is not pretty, it's not, preparing for a round two, in my view. Yeah, that's why there's this huge divergence where the economy continues to go south 
while the stock market has continued, has already moved north. Okay, so I think, in my view, I think round two is very likely. Yeah, I don't think the virus has been knocked out of, in round one. Yeah, neither has this uh, economic uh, crisis knocked out in round one. Uh, so round two is beginning as countries are getting out of the lockout. Yeah, so I think how, how round two will look like, firstly, could there be a resurgence of this COVID-19? Just the news today, you know, fresh out of the oven. Yeah, so there was a news from China. They're saying that there's, they suspect that this virus has my mutated. Yeah, because now, the period that it takes you know, to, show, to show up in a person, yeah, like fever, cough, is taking even longer than the virus was initially detected. Yeah, so the, now, a lot of these countries, as China is stepping up on the, out of its, uh, to reopen its economy, yeah, their traces of viruses start to evolve again. Yeah, and it can evolve in a mutated form. Yeah, so of course, if the world, you know, this is a resurgence of this COVID-19 virus yeah, after the reopening, basically, I think world government has to U-turn. Everybody has to go back to the lockdown situation. And bear in mind, every time you go back to a lockdown situation, companies are running out of cash. Households are running out of cash. Yeah, because every time it goes back, yeah, although revenue has stopped, cost has not stopped. Yeah, so I say that people are getting poorer, companies are getting poorer. We are getting closer to this thing called a solvency crisis, yeah, where companies and people are going bankrupt. Secondly, it could also be, you know, this virus was quite, will, will be quite tame. However, the economic recovery is slow yeah, in terms of its consumption and business spending. Yeah. So later, I'll show you some slides on this. Or thirdly, some industries, although you know, after this uh, virus has passed, yeah, they could be permanently affected. Yeah. So maybe 5-10% of the industries may never, may never leave to see the daylight. Okay, so the first one I'd like to talk about, yeah, uh, renewed outbreaks. This is in um, by CNN, a renewed outbreak in South, Afri South Korea, Germany, and China. Yeah, so it shows a continued risk as more countries seek to reopen. Yeah, will we see a resurgence? Yeah, so this is what uh, I'm especially, I would say, skeptical about the reopening of US. Yeah, because I think Donald Trump is very, he has probably two of his eyes on the year end election. His re election is on November. And as, as we stand, he has about half a year to wait. Right. Like I said the last time, you know, one of the previous presidents, uh, Bill Clinton, he said, no, don't, don't get over, overly complex about whether you can get re-elected. It boils down to one thing, which is the economy. He said, is the economy stupid? If the economy does well, well you will get re-elected. Yeah. If during your term you don't do well, you can kiss your re-election goodbye. So given it's so near, well, I think Mr. Donald Trump is actually very uh, anxious that the economy gets on track because that's what he's been boasting about, that he's been, uh, I'll say, causing you know, the best times in the US economy. Yeah, and the stock market has been his record, report cut that has been going up. And now the report cut is coming down, you know, going from an A to a B to a C. So I think he's very anxious to reopen the economy. Yeah, but however, he's a medical advisor, does not think likewise, like a, Dr. Fauci, he's a top medical uh, advisor in the area of this uh, viral infection. Yeah, so they strongly suggest that a, vi a vaccine will take at least a year to develop. And a vaccine is the only thing that will give American confidence in a full reopening of the economy in the absence of widespread testing. Okay, what do I mean? Actually, the only thing that yeah, people will go out safely and start to reopen, you know, engage in the economy is number one, that's the vaccine. And everybody gets a dose of the vaccine and they know they are protected. Or number two, the testing is done on a widespread manner. And hence, the government has the information who has COVID-19 and who don't have. So then they can safely quarantine all those who, has, who have the COVID-19. And the rest who go out on the street, they feel safe. Okay, they know that everybody who's on the streets don't have this COVID-19. With the absence of these two, let's look at the next slide. Yeah. So this is what, uh, so in the absence of these two, 
economic recovery will be slow. Just think of yourself, for example. Let's say if the Singapore government decides to leave this uh, circuit breaker and they say, okay, now everybody is free to go out to watch movies, to go out to have beer with your friend. What would you do? Do you imagine that a movie theater will be full house in the first movie that you're going to watch? Because people feel safe now because the government allows people to go out? Or, you know, or, the, or the beer bar be full house? I don't think so. I think the, the government allowing people to go out doesn't mean people will go out and spend money. I think everybody is going to adopt a very cautious stance. But if they go out, you know, put on the mask, uh, don't go out very long, avoid the crowd. So it's going to take time. You know, even I'll say there's no resurgence. It's going to take time for the recovery to happen. So recently, the uh, chairman, Jerome Powell, so he said that the Fed will deploy its tools to the fullest yeah, because he really wants to avoid a uh, financial market meltdown, which will exacerbate this economic meltdown. So he said, uh, I just read to you, yeah, Powell's ominous tone is in stark contrast to his remarks early last month, that the rebound can be fairly quick and robust, a shift that reflects the deep job and economic losses the pandemic already has inflicted and the growing prospect of a halting recovery. So as you say, the economy, the economy is not looking very bright. So it's actually a divergence from the stock markets. And some industries could be permanently affected. Okay, I'll share with you um, the CEO of Microsoft, uh, Satya Nadella. So in his recent quarterly report in, uh, for Microsoft, uh, he said that what took two years, two years worth of digital transformation has just happened in two months. Because in the last two months, it basically speed up this whole digital uh, transformation. Because everybody stays at home, like it or not, they have to get accustomed. Just like myself, you know, I, I hardly use such a video conferencing prior to this. It's a habit that I find it hard to break. Because it's foreign, you know, I don't know how difficult it is to use. But now because of the lockdown, I have to work from home and no choice, I have to learn how to use things like Zoom, Microsoft Teams. And it's broken my habits. And now I start to use it, I got very comfortable with it. So I read to you again the key points. Yeah. Prolonged quarantine may alter consumer behavior in ways that won't be reversed. Yeah. And the effects of consumer behavior will be determined by the length of at-home stays and will differ from industry to industry. Also, they look at some of these industries yeah, that could be uh, severely affected. Yeah. So basically, it speeds up the disruption. So the, whatever has been disrupted will continue to be, to be disrupted, but at a faster pace. Yeah, so for example, things that requires people to go out, like watching movies, uh, traveling. Yeah, in the past, people may think twice now going forward. Hey, do I really need to travel you know, 24 hours or 20 hours to go to the US to meet my counterparts? Or could we just you know, meet each other at the comfort of our home or office using Zoom? Yeah, they will start to have a rethink. So I think it's going to dampen global travel, global business travel. And how about real estates? Talking about offices. You know, I think companies will start to have a think. I was just talking to a, uh, another SME and they're they are really having a think. Well, maybe it could work, people working from home. And we could scale down our office space. We could reduce rental, reduce our company's expense without productivity being affected. Previously, maybe they were apprehensive to try. But now they are being forced to try. If the results are good, why not? And if everybody, let's say, have you know, a quarter of half the workforce or even taking turns to stay at home to work, what do you think of the need for commercial real estate? I think it's also going to face a disruption. You know, less and less office space will be needed. Similarly for retail, yeah, people are used to shopping online. Also, some of these industries uh, will really, when they come out of this crisis, they realize that their world is no longer the same as the past, even if it's just two, three months of lockdown. Because humans are like that, you know, habits are hard to break, but once it's broken, we form new ones. Okay, maybe now we can, uh, you know, Shereen can help me see. Given what I've shared, how would you actually invest, you know, in such an environment? You can key in just in the chat room. Some example is, well, maybe, can we make it sound so uh, scary? Maybe let's keep cash first until things are clearer. 
Or would you say, well, let's stay halfway, 50-50? Or you say, well, the market is already going up. I don't want to miss it. Let's get 100% invested. Or maybe, you know, some other variation. Okay, so, so for those who are looking at the screen with the option of 1, 2, 3, and 4, it will be good because we want some interaction, right? And we want to understand what most of you will feel. So probably you can choose it and then answer it in the chat room. I see that there are a lot of answers up already. Let me just take a quick look. Kimi, you, can, Thanks, you can drink some water first. <laughs> because the response is very overwhelming. I still see people typing. So just give me a while. Yeah, uh, then you can see maybe, uh, see what are the people's response. Yeah. Okay, now I think majority choose two. That means they, they are staying half invested at the moment. That is majority. Okay, I see Andy, he put 80-20, 20% cash. So I believe you, may, you mean like 80% invested, right? Okay. And then half, half. Okay, let me see. For those who choose four, that means other variation. Um, William put do asset allocation because each asset has different frequency. Hmm. Okay, but KB, from what I see, actually majority, they are putting half-half. So they, okay. want a, they want something balanced at the moment. Maybe you can share more. Is this okay. the, a good thing to do at the current juncture? <laughs> okay, thank you everyone. Um, so half-half is about the stance that we take. Um, why? I think the risk of being over and under invested now are risky. Okay, I think over being over invested, uh, I maybe don't have to explain too much because of what I share. Yeah, because if this divergence currently the stock market is going up while the market while the economy is trending down. Yeah, if the stock market were to snap and join back the economy, yeah, I think we're gonna have a big fall from here. So I think being over invested today, uh, well, emotionally at least. Yeah, if it falls, you know, then you could be in quite a turmoil. Now, how about the risk of being underinvested today? Okay, I think the risk of underinvested is high as well. Because just now I mentioned, the Fed is printing a lot of money, keeping 0% interest rates. And that's the, that's the same story for most developing countries. Zero interest rate to negative interest rates. Negative interest rates, interest rate is like the gravity you know, of uh, asset prices. So the higher the interest rate, the stronger the gravity. It pulls down asset price. But when you set the gravity to zero, it means that stock price can fly. So today I give an analogy. It's like a, a ball, a big ball, that has a very high pressure to explode upwards. But I put a 100 kg block on top of that ball. And the ball doesn't explode upwards because of the 100 kg block. But if I remove that block, the ball is going to explode upwards. And what is that block? That block is the COVID-19. So today of this uncertainty, it has not exploded upwards despite the very uh, favorable monetary condition of 0% interest rate and printing money. Yeah. So I think if this COVID-19 is over and I take away that block, there's a high chance that the ball may actually explode upwards, which is a set price. Yeah. So I think uh, to, be, to be totally uninvested, we don't know when will this rally continue or not. Yeah. So that could be a risk. So I think 50-50, is also currently about our stance. Yeah. I mean, we are between about 40 to 50% equities and about 50 to 60 in gold and cash. Yeah, thank you very much for your participation. Okay, just want to go through quickly. I say, important investment decision. Firstly, like what William mentioned, it's about asset allocation. Yeah, so this is the first thing we need to be doing. Yeah. Asset allocation means, where do we want to be in? Okay, I won't share so much on this today. I'll share more on asset selection. Asset selection means, let's say, if you want to invest in equities, what kind of equities you want to be in? Not all equities are the same. Yeah. You know, uh, so we have different kinds. Later, I'll show in more detail. Bonds, there are different kinds of bonds as well. They are not all the same. Although the environment could be quite similar. I shan't share for the rest. Because today, I'll focus on equities. Okay. Uh, there are four types of businesses. I call it the mature and stable. Cyclical growth, structural losers, and structural winners. Almost every businesses in this world fall into one of these categories. And each of them has a very distinct behavior. And if you know where is your stock, which category it is, it may not be a strict category, but if you have a good feel where it falls under, 
then at least you know what, how is the characteristic like and you know what to do with the stock. Like the Chinese saying, 自己自比白帐不带. Yeah. So if you know yourself, you will know the stocks that you are investing in, where the, each category falls in. Yeah, you won't lose. Okay, I just share using uh, these four categories using their share prices. Okay, each one is represented by a company. I will gradually unveil them. Today, I'll unveil one. Okay, a cyclical growth. Look at that. In the 2008, right, from the peak to the bottom, you drop 67%. Because cyclical growth companies are those that are highly affected by the economy. When the economy turns south, it falls more than the general market usually. Okay, so there's cyclical growth. Today, this is dropping down. If you look at the right side of the charts. Okay. I talk about the mature and stable. Also look quite volatile. Yeah, it, it is also volatile. But if you look at, uh, at the last crisis, it actually corrected less than the cyclical growth. Later, and then, over time, I will show you as well. So today, the, my case study is on cyclical growth. Uh, if we, I manage to finish the next week, we'll talk, the next two weeks time, the next episode, we'll talk about mature and stable. You know, I'll show you what exactly the difference beside the stock price. Thirdly, the structural decline. Right? So until today, it has never seen daylight. Maybe it never will see daylight anymore for the investor. Yeah. From the same time period, it's down 68% yeah, and continue to drop. That's a structural decline. Okay? Structural growth, right? So since the same time, it's up 670%. So they're actually quite different which I'll go through one by one in the various episodes. Today, I'll just look at one, which is DBS, yeah, which I think is a, it is a structural growth type of company. Okay, I will differentiate the four different types of companies by these things. Firstly, growth. Yeah, what is 10 years profit growth? Secondly, we look at their profit growth during difficult economic environments, like a recession. Yeah, and usually, we want to have a return on equity Later, I'll show you how that formula is being computed yeah, of more than 10%. This means that it can compound its growth yeah, by about 10% per year, which we think it is attractive enough rate. Secondly, we also look at the dividend yield over time. Yeah, how different are they? Yeah, the different categories. Yeah, we also want to look at risk, yeah, being how leveraged they are, how much, how much debt they are. And in this time of disruption, we want to look at the driver of that growth. Uh, to, make, to make sure that it's not it's remain intact. Because looking at numbers alone, at past trends alone, are just not good enough. Yeah, because if it's disrupted from today, the past trend may not show it. But if you understand the driver, you could then have some sensing. Okay. Yeah, so I just quickly go through this. That's not enough time. Okay, so for growth, cyclical growth depends a lot on economy. Yeah. Mature and stable, it tends to have very slow growth. Structural losers has negative growth. Structural winners has fast growth. Dividend yield. Cyclical growth, I'll say, uh, it varies by the quality of the company. However, one likely trend is during poor economic time, especially if it's prolonged, dividends tend to be cut yeah, because they suffer quite a lot. The, the intrinsic uh, strength of the, econ of the country, company. Mature and stable, the, the dividends tend to be high and stable. So they're quite a good source for dividends. Structural losers are high. The dividend yield is high, but are reducing. Okay, the structural winners tend to have low dividend yield, but they are growing pretty fast. Okay. The risk. For cyclical growth company, yeah, the risk is a prolonged e slow economic growth. Yeah, it'll be very detrimental for such company. Yeah, they tend to be more, most volatile during the economic downturn. Mature and stable, um, the risk is they become structural losers. Yeah. My fear is the telco could have become structural losers. In the past, they were the mature and stable. Yeah, the likes of especially the startups. Yeah. I think it could have fell into the structural loser category yeah, if the business is being disrupted. Okay, so structural losers are value traps. So some, some people will say, oh, you know, this company is not so cheap. Let's go and buy relative to their past. But they're value traps. Such companies are cheap and they get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper over time. They never recover. So they are trapped. So don't just buy a company just because you look at the past and now it's 50% below its uh, peak. 
yeah, if fundamentally, fundamentally if they're affected, yeah, they will just never recover. Structural winners, the risk is usually they don't come at a cheap price. Valuations are high. So if growth were to slow, yeah, the share price could be punished. Okay, next I'll look at the pros and cons. Okay, maybe this time I'll skip this because I don't have enough time. Uh, the next session, I promise I'll come back to this. Okay, I'll go straight to DBS. Okay, using those what I've shared with you, look at its earnings growth, dividends growth, share price growth, and business drivers. I think I'll skip this as well. Huh? Sorry, not enough time. We may look at it the next time. Okay, let's look at DBS earnings growth over time. So you can look at it, you know, from this chart alone, you can probably see a pattern. This chart starts from 2006 to today, which is about 15 years. You can see a pattern. There were two times that the share price dropped, one more than the rest. Yeah. So in 2008, the earnings per share. Okay, now I'm, looking, I'm not looking at stock price. Huh? I'm looking at actual fundamental. The earnings actually declined 35% from 2007 to 2009. Yeah. Because cyclical growth company, yeah, their earnings tend to be quite affected by the economy. And it took five years for the, for the earnings to be rebound back to the pre-crisis earnings, pre-crisis level. Okay? And more recently, yeah, in about 2015-16, the economic growth slows, interest rate fell, so the earnings also fall. Okay, look at that. Uh, so this is the growth trend I share with you. 2008 and 9, and 2016, uh, that's where you see growth slowing down, according to the World Bank. And when growth slows, interest rate tend to follow. Yeah. So you see, you can see the two times. Of course, 2006 to 2009, there was a big fall in the interest rates. But there was also a mini fall, actually, in 2016. So actually, all these gets the interest rates, the economy get reflected into DBS earnings. Okay, the return on equity is how I compute. Okay, what is return on equity? Return on equity is like, if I invest in something, what is the rate of return? Yeah, based on the money that I put in. So in this case, the equity of DBS on the right side, right, 52 billion, that is their equity. The profit which they made in 2019, you know, it's actually 6.5 billion. All right. So if I take 6.5 billion, which is the profit, divide by uh, the equity, you're actually getting about a 12% return on equity, which is quite good. Uh, to, be, to be fair, DBS is a pretty well-run bank. Okay, let's look at the dividends. Okay, the dividends also fell in 2008. So the dividends was cut by 18%. And remained that way until 2017. Okay, and then recently you saw a big jump because interest rates starts to go up. Now, if I look at this, uh, yeah, interest rates starts to go up, you know, from 2016 17, which will benefit the banks and the economy also starts to uh, turn up. So, all this will actually have a, a health, uh, be a, have a positive effect on the banks. Plus, the fact it's pretty well managed, so it actually went up. So the dividends can get cut for a cyclical growth company during a bad time. Okay, so I just want to show you if you are a cyclical growth company. If I draw a horizontal line, okay, at the point of its last peak in 2007, we can see that as at today, we are back to that level. So it basically go bounce up and down along that horizontal line. Yeah, it doesn't have a long, it doesn't have a constant upward trending kind of a I would say a line of, of trend. So I think in, for a cyclical growth company, if you know what you're buying is a cyclical growth company, then timing could be quite important. Yeah, because when the times are very good and you get a healthy share price appreciation, you may really want to consider to sell all or part of it. You have to lock in your profits. Otherwise, when the economy turns south again, you see all your profit evaporate. So you'll come down again to below that red line. Yeah. Uh, so I said DBS today has gone back to about its 2007 peak. Why I say DBS is quite well run, I show you some of the other banks and you probably can see for yourself. And the, major, the rest of the banks are very well known banks. Okay, HSBC. So actually because of this low and negative interest rate, it's taking a toll on banks. HSBC has gone back, 
not to its 2007 peak. It is today at the trough of 2009. So imagine at the worst time, the, the greatest panic during the last recession. Yeah, today, HSBC is at the same price. Their worst ones, half of Stan Chart. And again, another very uh, well known bank. Right. So today, Stan Chart is almost 50% below the trough of 2009. Look at a few more. Okay, Deutsche Bank. Yeah, the name that has the Germany name on it, Deutsche. Okay, it's 75% below the March 2009 trough. Credit Suisse. Another well-known bank, 72% below its March 2009 trough. 2009 trough, we're talking about one of the worst recession yeah, and at the worst time of it. And today, can you imagine, 72% below that level. So it's, uh, banks are having a very difficult environment yeah, with a very low interest rates. Yeah, so I said, DBS being one of, the, one of the better run banks, is at least back to the 2007 peak. Okay, so that's, this is dividends. Uh, this is a DBS yeah, from Bloomberg. Yeah, dividend yield, not bad, close to 7%, quite high. Okay, and uh, the CEO of DBS um, is saying that you know, um, cutting dividend now is nonsensical and a bit of a red herring. So he's saying that DBS has quite a, a lot of buffer and they don't see DBS cutting its interest rate yeah, if this crisis is not prolonged. But if it's prolonged, then he does not rule out cutting is the dividends. Oh, so at least for the moment, I think DBS dividends could be quite safe. Okay, then the last one I said, look at the driver. Yeah, because what we've seen so far is the past of DBS. What are the driver of banks? Okay, banks are very much de economy dependent because when economy is doing well, then people will take loan. Yeah, why will people take loan if, you know, to buy properties, to start a new business in the midst of a recession? Most people won't do that. Fees as well, you know. Uh, the, the people won't want to buy up other companies. People don't want to list their companies uh, during uh, bad times. So loans and fees growth during bad economy tend to be depressed. And not to forget, when in a poor economy, companies start to go bankrupt and the risk of uncollectable loans, yeah, which is a very big part of banks. You know, banks are so highly uh, leveraged. So long as 5 to 10% of their assets go bad, that bank is technically bankrupt. Yeah, so it doesn't need to have a lot of its loans being uncollectable. 5 to 10%, the bank will go insolvent. Again, it's very economic dependent. Yeah. So in bad times, uh, the bank will have more bad loans. And today, we are in zero interest rate environment. Yeah, for us, you know, we, unlikely we want to put our money in the bank and pay the bank in money, fees or interest to put our money there. If you need to pay money, we may keep more of our money at home, put it in a safe or whatever, keep cash. Yeah. So I said, uh, today, interest rate environment is near to zero. In Europe, it's negative. Yeah. So such environment are usually very, very uh, detrimental for banks, especially if it's prolonged. Yeah. Because banks need, they borrow money for us, and they lend money back to us or back to other businesses. So there must be a differential in rates. If the rates are about the same, the money they get from us, the, the rate that they pay to us, and the, the rate they lend out are quite the same, then the bank don't make money from lending. Yeah, so all these three tend to be depressed during a slow economic growth. So if I say if round two comes back and it comes back in a big way, then I think having a lot of DBS, you really need to reconsider yeah, because they, will, they are a company that will be hugely impacted by the economy. The fourth one is more structural, risk of disruption. I was just talking to uh, some of the students that I, I was uh, conducting a course, a public course. So they were uh, sharing about StarHub. One of the students um, actually posted something about StarHub. <clears throat> yeah, StarHub uh, withdraw its dividends, withdraw its guidance, earnings guidance. Yeah, actually, this kind of disruption kind of started in Singapore when the government introduced the fourth telco. Once the fourth telco happened, what I see is the local telcos, the StarHub M1, Singtel, started to slash their, uh, their rates yeah, for the post, postpaid, prepaid phone rates. Yeah. So this fourth telco actually 
the effect is it caused a price competition among the existing player. By itself, it didn't create much things. So today, as I say, there's a good chance some of this telco, yeah, I think especially startup, we could go the way of a structural losers from a mature and stable company. And of course, some, somewhere about now, I think uh, the government said by middle of this year, they're going to issue two virtual banking licenses. Of course, will this be the disruption, just like the false telco to the telecommunication? Will the issuance of virtual banking license do the same for banks? Today is an unknown. But some of these virtual banking, uh, the people who applied are big players. The like of Alibaba, the like of ByteDance, a major competitor for Alibaba, Singtel, Grab. So they're actually pretty powerful players that are bidding for this banking license. If they come in, what will it do to the bank? At the moment, the bank thinks it won't have a big impact. Well, I'm not so sure yet. Okay, so my take on DBS, if round two would happen, yeah, I think that's a big risk there. Yeah, it will be severely impacting the fundamentals of DBS. And I think economic growth is likely to be slow after this crisis yeah, because people have been hit. Yeah, and when you, have, when you have been hit, you know, hit once, you tend, to be, you tend to retain in the memory. People don't just go and uh, spend freely. Uh, they may want to save more money. And when you save more, you consume less, the economic growth slows down. Yeah, and I think we are very likely to have a prolonged period of low interest rates, given the high debt loads by the global government. Yeah, because if they increase the interest rates, or they allow the central bank to increase the interest rate, it basically increases their interest rate expense. And given the high amount of debts, especially those that were increased over this crisis by the, local, by the global government, they really can't afford to have an uh, interest rate going up very much. Yeah. So I think if these three happens, yeah, then DBS will, be, will not be in such a good shape. So the pros of DBS is the relatively attractive dividends, close to 7%. I think in today's world, it's quite attractive that the CEO wants to keep the dividends that way, at least, at least in the short term. The cons is, yeah, like what I shared just now, dividends could be at risk as well if the economic crisis prolongs. Virtual bank, I think not a big threat immediately, yeah, but could be a surprise as they are big contenders. So if you ask me my take, I personally don't own DBS, yeah, but if I were to have a choice, yeah, you know, um, I would probably not own it, or even if I own it, it will be a measured proportion of my portfolio. It's not going to form a big part of my portfolio. So I don't, I mean, in case people get very attracted by the 7% dividend yield, uh, I think it's good to stay on a, a, a buy it at a very measured pace. Yeah, I think that is uh, what I'd like to share. You know, I, I didn't have, sorry, I didn't have time to cover all yeah, because of the short amount of time. So of course, I also want to take some uh, Q&A. So Shereen, maybe I pass it back to you. I, I get out of my screen. Hold on. Huh? Okay, sure. Thank you, Kate Lee. That would be helpful. Kiwi, uh, thanks for sharing with us about the DBS, your, yep. your take. Because in fact, from the registration list, we do have a few, quite a number of clients who ask about DBS. And I believe, just now from your sharing, you have answered quite, quite a number of them. There are two questions mm. still regarding DBS, which I feel probably is worth discussing a bit. Uh, it's actually from two friends here today, Kwang Ping and Wendy. So, KB, maybe I can share with you the two questions. You can take them in and then maybe when you share, probably see whether you are able to share uh, as one question. Would that be good? Okay, okay, can. Okay, thanks, KB. So, uh, one of the questions is, because KB, you mentioned banks are cyclical stocks, right? So, does mm. that mean if I buy low now and sell it when the market recovers, with the assumption that it will recover together with the market since it's cyclical, I will still be able to make money. So that is mm. the first question. Then the second question, if an investor has a longer investment, uh, investment time horizon, like 5 to 10 years, will banks like DBS be still worthy to invest in despite them being cyclical industries? At the moment, the economic outlook seems bleak and banks may be affected. But when the economy recovers, banks have been showing, okay, banks have shown to also perform well. Why is it not a good time to invest in banks now that with the pandemic, which is likely to be temporary, 
have caused their share price to be much lower than the norm. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think the local banks has corrected, their share price has corrected by about 30%. Uh, of course, I say that I think the most people are not, most uh, people who, I'll say the, the stock market is not pricing in the, the round two. Uh, so uh, the, the question is, of course, you know, if round two happens, it could go a lot lower. Uh, so of course, you, first you have to be prepared. If you buy it now, if, and if round two happens, yeah, uh, 30-50% volatility could be likely for a cyclical growth company. Uh, so firstly, you've got to be prepared. That means if it's $19 today, yeah, maybe it could go to around 10 yeah, or maybe 10 to $13 yeah, if uh, the economy turns south. Okay, so that's number one. Uh, you have to have the emotional capacity yeah, to withstand this. Yeah, so I say, well, if you really want to buy DBS, perhaps don't, don't go all in now. Yeah, you may want to put in 50%, 30%, 50%, yeah, such that if it, re it really goes up, you know, then you can at least have be partially have, having that share. Uh, if it goes down, at least you still have some ammunition uh, to be buying uh, DBS. I'm not talking about your total portfolio. Uh. I'm talking about the amount that eventually want to allocate to DBS. Uh, if it's going to be 5% on the portfolio, then maybe put 2.5%, 2 to 2.5% today. That is firstly, but you got to, a company may not stay in the same category forever. What if it falls to the structural now, why we fall to the structural loser category like I showed for you the other banks. The other banks, the Deutsche Bank, the Credit Suisse, the 10 chart, you know, it didn't come out with the economy. It, it, is, it continued to sink. Yeah, because one of the environment, which is the interest rates, yeah, if it stays zero for a long, long time, yeah, then it could, from a cyclical growth, it could become a structural loser. Yeah, just like the Deutsche Bank. So that means you may not, you may not recover. So I think um, you've got to be mindful investing in the bank. Or if I say the virtual banking license, if it's being issued and then like a, what the fourth telco did to the, our existing three telcos, yeah, then the bank may not go back to the good old days. Yeah. The, the environment, the competitive environment could be different. Yeah. So I said, uh, Cyclical growth is not the type of company I, I favor most at this point of time. I hope, you, I hope uh, our friends can stay on because as I share more about a structural growth company, which is the fourth type of company I like to talk about, then you get to realize you know, how attractive that kind of companies could be yeah, compared to the cyclical growth. So I say that uh, I've named you the risk, yeah, which is uh, if a prolonged interest rate happens, it could go into a structural decline. Yeah. Or if a threat from the virtual banking license, yeah, that it could disrupt this whole banking industry in Singapore. Uh, so that could cause a cyclical growth to move into a structural decline, a structural losers. Or if that don't happen, but round two happens, then I think DBS may have a lot more to fall, being a very economic dependent kind of company. Yeah. So I think uh, yeah, the, pro the, the bright side, of course, is still a well-run bank. Dividend is pretty high. Uh, so I say if you want to own it, say especially for its dividends, um, I really recommend go with on a measured amount. Say 5%, 2.55%. Yeah, I, I don't recommend you to have 30-40% in DBS at this moment. Yeah, at, least, at least I wouldn't own that 30-40% in DBS. Okay, I hope I answered your question. Thanks, Kate so in fact, you are not saying that DBS is a bad company to invest in, but the exposure to DBS, if it's your take, it would keep it low at the current juncture. It's a quite well-run bank, but the whole banking environment is not favorable. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's in a, one of the better company, but in a poor environment yeah, of 0% interest rate. That is a poor environment for banks. Mm. Thanks, Kate Lee. Uh, Actually, I still see uh, a few questions coming to us on banks, but I think um, due to time constraint and like what Kate Lee mentioned, if you can continue to follow us on our series, as Kate Lee mentioned about the different types of uh, companies, especially structural growth companies, probably that can help you to solve the question as well. Okay, because yeah. uh, due to time constraint, uh, we, we would only be able to take in one more question. So this question uh, is actually- sorry, from, sorry. Uh, I, maybe I suggest this. No, we, 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 we could consider. 
You know, if you, because uh, now I'm only sharing one type. As I go on, then you understand the four different categories of companies. Perhaps after that, we can have one session, we just do Q&A. Then we can really take in a lot more questions. Yeah, so okay. I said, we hope this to be a, a long uh, episode that you can stay with us an hour every two weeks. Yeah, so we can, get, we can get educated and hopefully it's entertaining also for you all. <laughs> yes. So I, I, I think the, the episode whereby it's all Q&A, we can answer a lot more questions than today. Yeah. Yeah. Can we close it with just one last question? Sure, sure. Okay, this is actually from uh, our guest today, Shu Cheng Kui. Thanks for the question earlier on. You mentioned some economists think that uh, the US federal's aggressiveness in printing money will result in hyperinflation, while the other economists argue that deflation shall be in play because of low demand and people are willing to have more savings at the moment. Therefore, if yeah. hyperinflation and deflation balance out, will the US economy be having this beautiful soft landing followed by U-shape or square root shape recovery rather than market crash? Okay, so we're talking about the economy, uh, yeah, which is different from the stock market. Yes. Okay. Um, Ishrin, can you repeat the, f- the first part of the question again? I suddenly just slipped my okay. mind. Okay, because the first part, um, some economists think that the aggressiveness, the aggressiveness in printing money will actually result in hyperinflation. Okay, okay I got it. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So firstly, I don't think they'll happen at the same time. Hyperinflation and deflation. Uh, unless you talk about stagflation, yeah, which means the economy is not doing well, but prices are going up. Yeah, so that stagflation could happen. But otherwise, uh, a deflation and inflation are basically opposite, right? So they don't happen together. Yeah. Maybe what you meant is a stagflation. Yeah. Okay, so maybe I share my views first. Uh, I'm more to the camp that deflation is more likely. Yeah. Especially in the short to mid term, even though a lot of money has been printed. Um, the reason is like that. Because, you know, it just doesn't mean a lot of money is printed means there'll be inflation. There's a second component which is called velocity of money. Yeah. And if a lot of money is being printed, but it just stayed at the bank. When it stayed at the bank, means people, because once I, let's say I borrow from a bank, the bank comes to me and then I buy something. I hand over that $1,000 to somebody to buy an iPhone. That $1,000 in the economy, because of my transaction, has now be, just became $2,000. And the, the person, the, the handphone seller, take that $1,000 and pay his supplier. That's another $1,000 moved in the economy. Yeah. So I think there's this velocity of money, which is how fast money moved. Yeah. So the same $1,000, it, be, it could become $10,000 or $50,000, depending on how fast it moves. Yeah. And at times when people don't spend that much, which I think is going to be quite likely because uh, everybody has a memory. Yeah. And today, as I said, about a quarter of a quarter of US working population has fought for unemployment claim. Yeah. That means they are out of job. And that's a quarter, one in four person. And a lot of small businesses are not having business. Yeah. And they probably start to see the virtue of you know, keeping some savings. Yeah. And, and of course, I say coming out of this COVID doesn't mean people will you know, just throw caution to the wind. Yeah. It will still be a very gradual. So I think in this kind of environment, it is, it is a uh, velocity of money will be slow. Yeah. And hence, even a lot of money is being printed. It could be like the last 10 years we've had that this money basically stayed with the bank and went into the asset market. Yeah. So last 10 years, that's what happened. Even though uh, the Federal Reserve has printed about 2.5, uh, 2.5 trillion yeah, over the QE1, 2, and 3, it didn't result in the inf- inflation. Or rather, it didn't insult, result in the inflation in the usual way. It only resulted in inflation of a set market. Uh, you see your stock price going up, property prices going up, but the daily food, it doesn't really go up. Because if the wealth is concentrated at the wealthy, it doesn't cause that kind of inflation that we see. Because a very wealthy person still is a, is a human being. He only eats three meals a day. He doesn't eat 50 meals just because he's got a lot of money. Yeah, so the kind of, his consumption is the same. He's just at those high-end level, yeah, he can spend more money. 
Yeah, so I say our usual household kind of expenses, it doesn't have a huge surge yeah, because the money are concentrated with the wealthy. Yeah, and hence, the inflation is at the asset market level. Which is why I think today, it's important for us, as said again, to be half invested or at least 30-40% invested because the next time round inflation takes place, I think it's again going to happen at the asset market level, not at the general price level. Yeah, that's what I see. Okay, thanks, Kiwi. Thank you very much for the extension of Q&A. And <laughs> I hope that we have answered your question also, um, our friend today. So, Kiwi, thank you very much. Thanks for your sharing with us for the past, I think, 40, no, close to 15 minutes. But should we just, let's just remember, let's take down all these questions. Uh, also, really, yeah. if we can have a session that just answer all these Q&A, then at least the people who took the effort to pen them down, you know, the effort won't go to waste. Uh, we can have our friends come back and we answer their question properly again. Yes, thank you very much. Because today's um, response for Q&A is really very overwhelming. We, we do see a lot of questions. And in fact, even the registration, registration uh, form, we see quite a number of good questions as well. So uh, for those of us, those of you who are with us today, stay tuned. We will let you know when will we be having a Q&A session. Okay. Thank you, Kiwi. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, now, as promised, as promised, we will be having some fun. Okay. It, I know that time is close to nine already, but this game wouldn't take too much of your time, probably just five minutes. So now, I need you to take out your handphone. Okay, the purpose of this game is very simple because you have spent your past hour with us and with Kate B. So we just want to have a recap of today's session, what you have garnered from the session. Some of the things could be what Kate B has been sharing with you earlier on. So it's going to be a fastest finger game. There are a total of five questions. Total of five questions are maybe my colleague Henry you can get ready the screen. So I will need you to take out your handphone. Okay, go to the website that you see, www.kaput.it. And then key in your, key in the pin. Okay, for those who are still keying in, right, it would be good if you can key in the name as per what you have um, registered with us in this Zoom. Okay, okay, I see 13 players are in already. Very fast. Okay, 25, 30, 32, 33, 35. It's going to be very fun and we will have one winner today who will win a prize. It's a surprise gift. Uh, let me see. Today we have like 236 participants. We hope to have 80% people joining us for the game. We will just take another minute for those who want to participate to join us. Very fast. Good. Any more? Any more? 131. <laughs> I'm not sure whether one minute is enough. <laughs> okay. Okay. Any more before we start? Okay, just last last fifteen seconds. Fifteen. 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, how come I see number decreasing? Uh? 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay, so we have a total of 149 players. Shall we start, Henry? Okay, 151. Okay, are you ready? There will be a total of five questions. First question. Should there be round two of the COVID-19? 
which of the following describe how round two will look like? See your answer first because you don't just need to get the answer correct, you also need to be the fastest finger. Okay, we are left with seven seconds for those who haven't submitted. Okay, time's up. So the answer is three. The third one, the yellow one. Slow recovery as people will still be cautious. Okay, very good. Majority of you actually got it correct. 125 of you. So shall we see? Henry, shall we see who is the fastest finger for this question? Cody! Is it Cody? Okay, Cody, congratulations. Your point is 923 nine, followed by JX. Just five points behind and then very closely followed by Lauren Ya. Yeah? And today we only have one winner. So nobody will remember number two and number three, let alone four or five. I'm very sorry. We will just be having one champion for the prize. Okay, shall we go to the second question? What kind of company does DBS belong to? That should be very, very easy. Oh, very fast. <laughs> Henry, I think we don't need uh, so long. One, five, two. Okay, I, if so many people. One, five, three. Okay, let's wait till the last five seconds. Yes! 156, got it, correct? Cyclical growth. Hmm, I'm just very curious. For those who chose stable and mature, 19 of you, I think you really, really have very, very strong faith in DBS. But I'm not sure whether Gateway will be very upset. Okay, and then uh, for, oh, Carol, finger too fat. No worries, you are forgiven because we still have three more. Three more questions to go. Okay, well done to the 126 people, uh, the 126 friends. Shall we look at the current result now up to question two? Henry, please. Oh, Cody, you are still maintaining your number one. But your next strongest competitor, Ingrid, is coming up. Okay, just two points below you. And then Fiona, you are at 1978. Very, very close. Okay, let's move on to third question. Which of these countries is the first to reopen its economy? Singapore? Is it Singapore? Or China? Or maybe it's Germany? Or USA? We have heard a lot from President Trump. Are they the first to reopen its economy? Yes, China. So China is the one who, who first reopened its economy. Okay, the rest of the countries, we are not sure yet. So very sorry to those who chose Singapore, Germany and USA. Okay, why not Taiwan? Very simple. There's no Taiwan in the four choices. <laughs> okay, thanks, Daryl. Okay, shall we look at the current result? Yes, no lockdown. They are very good in containing. Okay. Oh, now we have a change. Leamington. Leamington, I don't know where you came from. Okay, but you are overtaking very fast. Followed by Fiona. Fiona, I still see your name. And then Lauren Go. Well done. Very good overtaking. Now let's move on to question four. If someone purchased DBS at the pre-crisis peak in October 2008, 2007, would his investment in DBS shares it appreciate by 100%? Appreciate by 25%? Remain at approximately the same capital value or you will have a loss of 25%. You have 8 more seconds to choose your answer. 
Oh no, I think we need the remaining 13. Then, it needs to be faster. Okay, so the correct answer is it will remain at approximately the same capital value from the previous peak. Okay, thank you. Uh, shall we take a look at the next slide, Henry? Let's see. Okay, Lemington, you are still at number one. Very good. Because we are only left with one question. Will Lemington be the one who will take back the title of the fastest finger today or someone else is going to overtake? Let's move on to the last question. Which of the following is not a significant factor that would affect DBS current profit? Okay, this answer is very is the answered very fast as well. One. Okay, so the factor that is not being considered, okay, is actually the popularity of his PayLa application. Hmm. Okay, are you excited? Are you excited to see whether the first five from the previous um, uh, ranking will still stay there or someone is going to overtake? None of us know. Only Henry can reveal to us. Henry, please. Oh, okay, well done to Lemington. Okay, followed by LCH. Hey, no, Lemington here has got number three. Okay, so, number one, we have T. T, you have successfully overtaken Lemington. Well done. So three of you got five out of five, but the fastest finger come from T. Well done, T. T, um, will you be able to drop a message, okay, in the chat group to our panelists so that our panelists will be able to contact you for the prize that you have won for today? <laughs> okay, Victor. Okay, very fun game. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that you all enjoyed the game just now. It's just a very simple game, but we, we do hope, hope that we are able to end off the session, the last part. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for those who enjoy this game. Okay, because uh, I mentioned this is going to be a series, right? So other than wanting to improve the content, improve on how this whole show is being planned and organized, we also hope to inject fun elements so that all of you will still come back to us on a bi-weekly basis. Okay? Thank you very much. So, uh, before we end off today, I just have a question. Okay, yes, I'll have one question to ask all of you. Okay, uh, I'm very sorry, there is no prize, but your participation is greatly appreciated. Okay, it's going to be a very simple question. All of you can answer. Um, this question is related to cars. So don't worry, be it you are a car owner or you don't own a car, this question is for you. So just imagine, okay, circuit breaker is over and on the 2nd of June, you wake up in the morning, you want to go to work. And then when you head to the car park, you take out your car key, you try to Start the engine of your car and you realize that hey, the car cannot be started. No matter how many times you try, the car just stayed there, no motion, no sound, no anything. So my question is, what would you do next? Would you, one, number one, so choice number one is that you will call someone to send the car to the workshop or Choice number two, you will take out the car key, close the car door, lock the car, leave the car there for the next one year 
as you live your daily life as per normal, hoping that the car will be okay one day. So which one would you choose? Will you choose one or two? One will be to send to the workshop. Second is to leave your car there. Okay, so far I see one. One la. <laughs> okay, sorry, uh, Mingjia, there is no three. Okay, so far I see one, yeah? Nobody choose two because I was thinking if anyone chose two, that means you have very, very strong faith in your God that it will be well one day. So that is the question about car. If it's me, I would have done the same thing. Okay, every time I observe something abnormal about my car, I will call the, the workshop, hey, I'm sending my car there. Second question, what about your investment portfolio? If your investment portfolio, you have observed that it has got some issues, it's not performing as per what you want it to perform. Caution, <laughs> thanks, Jagi. <laughs> so, do you send your portfolio for some repair, or you will choose to leave your portfolio at the side, not looking at it, hoping that your portfolio will recover its loss, its loss, or even make profit. So that's a question for you to ponder because um, today we have 200 over guests who are with us today. Some of you, some of you would have invested yourself. You might be having a portfolio uh, that is making money, that is going according to what you wish. For those friends who is not happy with your current investment portfolio, have you thought about getting somebody to help you repair it? So here, I would like to just share with you one of our services in Unicorn. Okay, we call it, okay, we call it the Unicorn Portfolio Repair Service. So like what I mentioned earlier on, if you belong to the group whereby you have a portfolio that you feel is not doing well, and you hope to receive professional advice on what to do to your existing portfolio, I have a good news for you. So if you want to know what can be done to your existing portfolio, now I just need you to take out your handphone, SMS your name to the following number. So for example, Shireen, I'll just type a message, Shireen, and I'll send to this number, 8221-1200. Okay, once this is sent, our friendly consultant will get in touch with you and then we will arrange a time to see how we can assist you from that. Okay, so I will just give you another 10 seconds, 10 seconds to type in your name and then send your name to this number. Okay, 10 seconds up. Thank you very much for those who, who want to explore having this uh, meeting and chat with us. Okay, last but not least, I hope you have enjoyed today, today's show. I'm going to share with you our Grey Rhino show episode three details. It's going to happen on the 3rd of June, 2020. Same thing is going to happen on a Wednesday from 8 to 9 p.m. So if you do have your handphone and you already know that you will be available on this day, you can just scan the QR code that is in the screen now. And then uh, for those who cannot confirm, not to worry, as I'm speaking to you now, actually our team is sending an email to you. So for all of you who attend this session, you will be receiving an email for the registration link for the next session. So we really look forward to seeing you again. Kate Will will, have be, will be having a lot more of his stories and his insights to share with all of you. So with this, I hope to thank all of you for being with us today. Look forward to seeing you in our next episode. Have a good night's rest. Bye-bye.